Okay, everybody, welcome back. Today I'm going to take you through the fractional banking um, system and money creation as it happens through this fractional banking system. Now, the way that your textbook and many textbooks usually teach this is an approach that is accepted. It's an approach that's driven by reserves and the amount of reserves in an economy. And that's typically accepted as a valid way of teaching this. But empirically, there's more evidence to suggest the approach I'm going to teach you here or show you here that is a more loan-driven approach to understanding uh, money multiplication. So the first thing we're going to look at here is what's going on with Chase Bank at its starting point, which I want you to appreciate from this framework that's a loan-driven approach to understanding fractional banking, we assume that a bank already has a kind of predetermined profitable amount of loans that it needs to make. And in this case, that profitable amount is 9000 right? Um, on the other side, then, we assume that the bank, after making these loans or determining that it needs to make these amount of loans, concludes what the reserves are that it needs and then seeks out those reserves. So in making the loans, for example, the bank would create $9,000 in loans on its balance sheet and another $9,000 in checkable deposits. So first thing to understand here is what is the balance sheet? The balance sheet is an accounting of the bank's assets, its liabilities, which is what the bank owes to other entities, and the net worth or the stockholders' equity, which is basically the value that stockholders are entitled to after considering the difference between assets and liabilities. Checkable deposits are part of the money supply. They are part of M2 which should theoretically mean in our traditional way of understanding money multiplication that checkable deposits are in some way a function of the reserves or the monetary base in the economy. In this model, it seems that checkable deposits are more of a function of the loans that banks are already making, right? So in both ways of of demonstrating this, there is an acceptance that when a bank makes a loan, it basically makes a checkable deposit on its on its uh, liability side. And the idea here being that by making a loan to somebody, the bank is opening up an account for them that basically has a certain amount of value in it that this uh, depositor can then extract from or borrow from, and that. In that process of doing that, the bank has basically put the money in two different places at the same time. And that is what allows the money to multiply. So through this more empirically supported approach, we assume that the bank makes $9,000 in loans, creates $9,000 in checkable deposits that are the complement to the $9,000 in loans. And in, after doing that, determines that it needs to create or needs to achieve a certain amount of reserves. It can achieve these reserves either by soliciting actual deposits. So it can solicit deposits from um, clients who may just be average shows or wealthy billionaires. It can vary, but of course, the idea here is that they would deposit money with the bank and the, that deposited cash would actually go into the reserves so that the bank could meet its required reserve ratio. The required reserve ratio is established by the central bank and it's basically the ratio of reserves to checkable deposits. So as a bank expands and makes loans, in this case $9,000, it creates $9,000 in checkable deposits. After that, the bank has to shore up enough reserves so that the ratio between its reserves and its checkable deposits is that the reserves are 10% of the checkable deposits. So we're looking at this uh, hypothetical Chase Bank uh, balance sheet where the bank has made $9,000 in loans and has shored up $1,000 in reserves, leading to $10,000 in checkable deposits, which is equivalent of the $1,000 in reserves and the $9,000 in loans. And there are other components to this balance sheet, too. Of course, in a, in a traditional... For a traditional bank's balance sheet, this becomes very complicated, and 
Um, I, we've really simplified it here by just looking at on the asset side, reserves, other assets, loans, and securities versus for liabilities, checkable deposits, debt, which is money borrowed, and other liabilities that the bank may have. So other money that the bank may have due outstanding to other entities. So here's our starting point. And now we're gonna see how different um, behaviors or different uh, events can impact the balance sheet for this bank. The first event that we're gonna look at is what happens if the Federal Reserve was to inject $1,200 into this bank specifically. So what happens here is that the bank's reserves increase by $1,200. The Fed is injecting these reserves into the bank by buying from the bank some securities, usually treasuries, almost always treasuries. Um, so the bank is effectively saying, I will purchase $1,200 in treasuries from you. And in return, I, the Federal Reserve, will put $1,200 in your reserve account. So what does that do? That increases the amount of reserves that the bank has on hand, which means that now the bank can make a proportional increase in its loans. Now, it's proportional in the sense that whatever increase the bank makes in its loans, in addition to, or in its loans after receiving the $1,200, would have to result in a checkable deposit amount that leaves the reserves as 10% of the checkable deposits. So in this case, that means that the reserves, by increasing by $1,200, can lead to an increase in loans of about $10,800. And you can see that what we have here now is that the loans made are $19,800, which is $10,800 more than the 9,000 the bank had started out with in cell C5. So in cell C18, you can see the $19,800. This, in combination with the reserves, leads to a checkable deposit amount of $22,000. The checkable deposits are equivalent to $12,000, right? You can see that $12,000 in cell E13, $12,000 more than what we'd started off with as checkable deposits. So what effectively happened here is that the Federal Reserve injecting $1,200 more in cash led the bank to have excess reserves so that the bank could end up in a situation where it was loaned up. In other words, so that it would not have any excess reserves, the bank would have to make enough loans so that the checkable deposit it generates from the loans, because every loan it makes has an equivalent checkable deposit made for it because of how the loans are done, right? The loan is basically money borrowed against an, a fictional checkable deposit account with the bank. The bank has to make enough loans that the checkable deposit total meets the required reserve ratio. They can't make more, right? So they can't, there's a possibility of making too many loans and the bank is trying to avoid that because then it would be under its reserve requirement and would probably have to borrow more money to meet the reserve, reserve requirement. But in this case, what we end up with is a situation that because the reserves are $2,200, the bank is allowed to have checkable deposits up to, or the bank needs to have checkable deposits up to $22,000. And to achieve that, the bank makes $19,800 in loans. Or in other words, because the bank has $1,200 more than it did before, it can now make $10,800 more in loans. And that results in $12,000 more in checkable deposits for the bank. Um, the bank doesn't have to make these loans, which is what's critical to understand here, right? The reserve approach to understanding fractional banking assumes that as the uh, uh, reserves of banks are increased, there is this direct connection to the money supply, which implies that the Federal Reserve and other central banks have a immense amount of control over their money supply. What really happens is that the Federal Reserve Injecting $1,200 is a green light to the bank that it can loan out more money. But the bank may choose not to if, for example, the economic conditions or economic outlook looks bleak. The bank may decide to hold on to reserves in case something else happens in its balance sheet, um, such as the remaining securities dropping further or some hit to other assets on the balance sheet that would require the bank to have more cash on hand to cover its uh, losses.
the bank may also not be able to make loans if other people, the borrowers, actually see that the economy isn't to their benefit either, right? If people in the economy are not actively participating in things, if they don't see that there's opportunity for them to invest, they're not going to borrow money. So no matter how much the Federal Reserve injects into the economy or into these banks, the banks may either choose not to make loans or may not be able to make loans based on the appetite for risk in the current economy. This is something called a liquidity trap, which we talk more about in our examination of monetary policy in depth. But it's just important to understand here from the approach of understanding that the money multiplication process is much more about banks' willingness to loan money as well as borrowers' willingness to borrow money. And that means that the Federal Reserve and its injection of cash won't automatically always lead to an expansion of the money supply. That the empirical evidence we've had since, uh, since the 80s kind of supports this uh, more nuanced way of thinking about the money multiplication process. Let's look at another example here. What happens if somebody deposits $20 in their cash of crash earnings into an account? The implication here being that somebody got paid for labor, they're depositing their paycheck into an account, and now we want to kind of examine how does that deposit impact the bank's, uh, the bank's balance sheet. So the $20 adds $20 to the bank's checkable deposits. It adds $20 to the reserves, which is more critical. All of this leads to a situation where you have $180 more in loans, as well as $200 more in checkable deposits created. I want you to appreciate that in both of these prior scenarios, in the Federal Reserve injection of cash, as well as the checkable deposits created, the situation here is that the checkable deposits create, I'm sorry, the Federal Bank's reserve injection of cash as well as the wages being deposited into the account. In both of these scenarios, the change in checkable deposits is equivalent to the change in loans plus the change in reserves. And what you're going to see here is that you're seeing the same thing where the change in checkable deposits is equivalent to the change in loans plus the change in reserves. So what happens, right? Um, the $20 gets added to reserves. So we see that in cell C29, the reserves are $20 more than they were in cell C16 in the prior situation. With those additional $20, now the bank can make additional loans because now it technically has excess reserves of $20. So in making those extra loans, the bank expands its uh, loaning potential by $180. And now we have checkable deposits that have grown by the equivalent difference of how many loans were created and how much additional reserves were added by the deposit from this wage earner. And that makes sense, right? Because if the person is depositing $20 then that's $20 in actual currency. So that $20 can be used to add to the reserves of the bank because it's actual currency that the bank can put into its reserve account, but it also does add to the deposit because now the person is actually increasing the deposit amount by the $20. After that, the additional deposits are the expansion of, or I should say they are derived from the expansion of credit based on this additional $20. The whole point throughout this, right, is that the injection of money into the reserves allows for multiplication of money to occur, but that is the critical part. It allows for the multiplication of money to occur. It doesn't have to happen, and the bank is going to do whatever is most profitable for it. So if adding $20 to the reserves, if the most profitable reaction to that is to expand loaning capacity to meet the new uh, regulated allowance or the new limit for the loans that can be made, then the bank will do that. But if it's not the most profitable decision, then the bank won't do that. In this case, we assume the bank uses the $20 to expand its loaning capacity and adds to its checkable deposits equivalent to the amount of the reserve add as well as the amount of the loans being added. And the reserve adds are the same as the checkable deposit adds.
Okay, so the final uh, scenario I'm going to show you is when someone writes a check from one bank to a friend with an account in another bank. So hypothetically, let's say this person is writing a check from Citibank, and on Citibank, they want to send the person $10 to their Chase account. The effect on Citibank would be a reduction in their checkable deposits by $10, a reduction in their reserves by $10, because the banks are basically going to send reserves to each other, right? The fact that they both operate in the same um, banking system means that they don't really have to, the, the step is as easy as transferring reserves from Citibank's account to Chase's reserve account. Um, the money created in this process would be zero, right? Um, at least for Citibank. And you'll see why that isn't a negative in a second. But there is a difference in debt that would be anticipated, a difference in debt that would be about $9 to cover the effect of losing the $10 in reserves. So what, what's happening here? Remember, right, the bank is going to approach this from a loan-based perspective. So the bank is not trying to reduce the amount of loans that it has outstanding. The amount of loans that it has outstanding is a profitable number for it. So let's say that the bank has, at this point, um, $8,100 outstanding because they started off from a position where they had $900 effectively in, um, in reserves, they made $9,000 out of loans and they had around, um, I'm sorry, they made $8,100 out of loans and they had a total of $9,000 in checkable deposits. Now $10 is sent away, right? So the $10 gets subtracted out from the checkable deposit side, but also from the reserve side. Now the first thing you might be asking is why aren't the reserves then um, lower than the $900. Why did they only diminish by about a dollar? Um, theoretically, the reserves, if the reserve amount for this, for this uh, institution was supposed to be $900, the loan amount remains the same, and roughly the reserve amount would end up remaining about the same. Um, so when the bank loses the $10 from its reserves, so that it can avoid having to adjust its uh, loans outstanding, the bank is probably going to borrow money from either the central bank, another bank, or from the public so that it can shore up its reserves and meet the new required ratio. If I were to unhide the column or the row above this, what you would see is that after the check clears, the bank actually ends up with $890 in reserves because $10 gets removed from its reserves, right? If the bank had um, $900 in reserves, it loses 10 because they're being sent to Chase. Then at first, the bank will end up with $890 in reserves. Now, if that happened to the bank, it would have to reduce the amount of its loans outstanding to meet the new reserve requirements, right? Because $890 is not enough to cover the 10% of checkable deposits. So in response, the bank would have to reduce its loans made and in turn, every reduction in its loan made would reduce its checkable deposits. The bank probably isn't going to do that in real terms because the bank is not actually going to try to reduce the amount of loans made. That's how it makes its money. So it's gonna to try to maximize to the highest extent that it can the amount of loans it's making and maintaining that while maintaining the required reserves. So the bank may instead borrow from somewhere else to have the reserves on hand so they keep the loans outstanding while still meeting its required reserve ratio for the checkable deposits. And in this case, that borrowing would be about $9 in debt that would be added to the debt section on the liabilities part of Citibank's uh, balance sheet. And by adding that $9, they use $9, they add it into reserves, and now the bank can maintain the same $8,100 in loans that it had going on before the transfer of money while um, still being within its legal obligations for its required reserve ratio.
Now, on the other side of this whole transaction, there's the Chase Bank, right, which is receiving the $10. So for Chase, the effect on their checkable deposits would be an addition of $10, right, because it's being rent to a friend who already has an account at Chase. It would be 10 additional dollars in reserves because this is a transfer in reserves from Citibank to Chase. Um, there is some money that would be created on Chase's account, right? So Chase would be creating some level of cash from this, but it shouldn't be new to the entire system because this is really just a transfer of money from one bank to the next. Um, and in return, the checkable deposits, of course, get increased by, again, an amount equivalent to the increase in loans plus the increase in checkable deposits that was accounted for. So in this scenario, right, Chase ends up getting 10 extra dollars in reserves, which you can see here, the 2,230 is $10 more than what you see in cell C29, which is 2,220. With that new amount, Chase can make more money in loans. So Chase now decides to increase its loans made by 20, to $20,070, which is $90 more than the 19980 going on in cell C31. And after increasing that amount, because it increases its loans, it also ends up increasing its checkable deposits. Its checkable deposit increase not only because of the 10 extra dollars that were added from the other bank, but also because of the $90 in new loans, which have to have an equivalent checkable deposit created for it. So in total, checkable deposits increased by $100. And you can see that the $22,300 in cell E44 is more than the $22,200 in cell E29. So why does it look like money is being created by Chase Bank specifically? Because... Citibank's reaction to losing reserves was to borrow money. Theoretically, that borrowed money isn't just coming out of the ether. The money is either being created by the Federal Reserve, the central bank, and loaned to Citibank, in which case it is actually creating money, and then Chase is actually creating money by accepting this new um, deposit because, in turn, Citibank borrowed from the Fed, or the money is coming from another bank, in which case the reserves are unchanged. The money supply in total is unchanged because there is theoretically a third bank that we haven't modeled here. Perhaps it's Bank of America that loans Citibank $9 so that Citibank can meet its reserve requirement. And by loaning Citibank $9, that money is coming from somewhere else, right? So it's coming from Citibank's reserves. So it's really just reserves moving around in a circle. If we assume that the Federal Reserve Bank did not loan any money to Citibank. Same thing if Citibank borrowed this money from outside, from the public. It would be cash basically moving from some other bank's reserves to Citibank. So the only time, the only situation where this is actually a creation of money on Chase's part is if Citibank was loaned the $9 to account for the transfer of money over to Chase. And Citibank was loaned that $9 specifically from the central bank in the United States, the Federal Reserve. So this is, these are the three major scenarios I wanted to illustrate for you with um, fractional banking. Just so you understand how money multiplication works in a more fully macro sense, we can look here and see, we can basically follow a hypothetical injection of $100 by a central bank and see how that would play out in multiplying or in multiplication. Again, this only works if we assume that the banks do not hold excess reserves. So ultimately, the determinant of the size of the money supply isn't really so much the Federal Reserve or how much money they inject as much as it is banks and borrowers and their willingness to either loan money if it's a bank or their willingness to borrow money if it's a borrower. So ultimately, the determinant of the size of the money supply really boils down to the risk aversion of banks and clients. But let's assume that the risk aversion is very low, that these banks, the bank that we're modeling in these scenarios or these banks are fully willing to loan out excess reserves. And for some reason, the Federal Reserve injects $100 into a single bank. The $100 if we assume a required reserve ratio of 10%, leads to $90 being loaned out, 
and ten dollars being held on reserve. That ten dollars being the ten percent of the hundred dollars. The ninety dollars loaned out goes to another bank, which in turn then follows the same process of trying to maximize its profitability, and it loans out ninety percent of the ninety dollars, which would be eighty-one dollars, and keeps ten percent on hand as reserves. And the process continues with $81 going to another bank and so on and so forth until we get down to this point, which it could be arbitrarily anywhere. I decided to stop at bank Z, but I want you to notice a few things here, right? When we look at the final um, total here, you can see that we have between the money in deposits and the money in loans, there is now about a thousand seven hundred and something dollars available in this uh, economy. All of that was multiplied strictly from the hundred dollar injection. So hundred dollars was now multiplied 17.7 times to reach this new value which is the power of the fractional banking system. If we only force banks to keep a fraction of their reserves on hand, then we can have an economy that expands based on transactions and risk aversion. Um, the only issue here is that the Federal Reserve can't really use the required reserve ratio as a real regulation or like um, guiding tool for impacting the economy because it's not clear that a bank will always loan out its excess reserves. And as we've had financial liberation in regulation since the 80s, there's been more of a disconnect between the money base, M0, and other types of money, M1 and M2, to the extent that the Federal Reserve can't reliably change the required reserve ratio to change the flow of cash or the supply of money in the economy. But so that you appreciate how that multiplication happens. You can see that happening here. And you can, would notice that if we looked at the total amount of reserves, so the fractional reserving reserve system would, of course, lead to every transaction having a small sliver of that kept in reserves. That total of reserves up to the last deposit in Z would total $92.82, $92.82. If you add that and the last deposit, it totals up to the $100 that we initially started with. So this is all to the point that even though the money gets multiplied, the actual amount of money in the economy in terms of the monetary base, the M0, theoretically does not change. What happens is that the M0 is a starting point. The $100 is always going to be the $100. And then the amount of transactions in the economy, the amount of times that $100 flows through different banks, determines how much it multiplies. Hopefully this has been a great explainer for you to understand not only that bank how banks operate in a fractional banking system but also to understand that even though the textbook teaches an approach that is reserve based we tend to see evidence that the the decisions from banks as far as multi money multiplication really starts from loans banks S banks make loans and then seek out the reserves to legally justify or legally cover the amount of loans that they're making. It's not, empirical evidence is not necessarily, empirical meaning real world evidence does not necessarily seem to suggest that banks take reserves or checkable deposits first and then make loans. Um, but regardless of that, you can appreciate that the money multiplication process or the money multiplication theory still holds out like, in the in terms of the fact that more money with banks cooperating with the, the approach of hey we need to loan out more money will lead to a multiplied amount of money in the economy adding hundred dollars to the economy if banks loan them out loan out the hundred dollars will lead to a multiplied amount of cash actually flowing through the economy even if the money base remains at the hundred dollars